functions, all these diffs on data, and propagate the data everywhere else. They basically do a lot of that boilerplate for you. But with that comes a bunch of performance challenges. Um, so anyway, I've had to think about performance quite a bit in my career, although I've only had one role, and that was at Facebook, as a, a, like, a performance engineer in an official capacity, but I've had to think about it quite a bit in my career. Um, um, all right, so what makes uh, performance so challenging in the first place? It's actually a pretty simple mandate, uh, much more simple than a lot of team missions. You just want to make the site faster, right? Uh, much of the time, you also own all the code, or at least you have the ability to go look at it. Um, and everyone agrees that performance is super important, right? So, so what's the problem? Why is it so challenging? Um, I think the first thing is it's, it's not a lot of engineers' first choice. You know, you have to spend a lot of time digging. Sometimes you spend a week investigating a really tricky issue, and, you know, you just have no return on that time investment. Personally, I enjoy that, because when I finally figure it out, then, you know, I'm the only person that did that. But for a lot of people, it can be kind of maddening. In fact, for me, sometimes it is still kind of maddening. Uh, the second thing I'll mention is that there's often no true North Star for a performance. What I mean by that is oftentimes you spin up these performance teams and they have a performance goal that they set. And then you meet the goal and you set a new one, but it's like, it just gets old after, you know, once or twice. Uh, what, what is the, the larger mission of the performance team and what is their place in your engineering org or your company? Uh, that's something that, you know, requires a lot of thought or, you know, people tend to get burned out. Um, the third thing I'll say is that it requires your very best engineers, but for the previous two reasons, they might not want to work on performance. Um, and it's not like they're being selfish. I think they're probably exercising good judgment because if you're not thinking about your performance team carefully, and you're not really setting that team up for success. Why would you join that team? Uh, so it often requires your very best engineers, but they often don't want to join the team. Uh, the fourth thing I'll mention is it is a very unique skill set, somewhat similar to what I mentioned previously. Uh, but it's not just about patience. It's also about understanding other people's code and systems really quickly. And it's not just about being really good at reading code. You know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of other skills that can make you really good at performance that you might not learn on other types of teams. Uh, so the last thing I'll mention is, even though everyone agrees that perf is super important, it's often not prioritized in a timely fashion. So people tend to wait until it gets really bad until the CEO loads the page and says, hey, this, this seems kind of slow. How, like, can I see a graph? Can I see a time series from the last year? And then people freak out and you assemble a team, which uh, often feels more like a firefighting unit. Um, but anyway, it's not prioritized in a timely fashion. Uh, and so when you come in late, you end up cleaning up a lot of really clowning mistakes, you know, for months or years. Uh, and that can make it challenging as well. Um, so what are some of the risks of, of failing to address those challenges I just mentioned? Well, obviously, business metrics will suffer. Uh, your engineers will get burned out. I've, uh, I've been at companies where literally every single person that worked on Perf over the course of a few years just left after working on performance, as crazy as it sounds. Uh, you end up with a lot of wasted time if you don't think carefully about how to structure your team, and I'll touch on why that is a little bit later. Uh, and then the worst part is that you just end up with this endless cycle of improvement and regression over and over again because there's no sustainable team or you don't think carefully about how to keep the site fast. It's all very tactical work, at least at the companies I've been a part of. Okay, so let me share the agenda with you. Uh, so the, here are the things I'm gonna talk about today. And throughout the course of this talk, I'm gonna talk about some of the strategies that I've used at the companies I've been a part of in the past to solve some of these challenges I just mentioned. Uh, so I'm gonna talk first about telemetry and tooling. Uh, I'm gonna talk about building alignment among stakeholders and the performance team and uh, other people that rely on the perf team. Um, and finally, I want to talk a little bit about how you define that North Star, or at least what's worked for me for defining that North Star. Um, so first, let's talk about telemetry and tooling. Uh, and this is actually a three-part section. So we're going to talk about metrics. First, how do you define metrics? What does a good metric look like? We're going to talk about how to reason about data. And this is one of those skills that sometimes you pick up in other areas, but is really important for performance. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about how to build the right tools. Of all the things you could be building that will help you solve performance problems, how do you prioritize the correct ones? So first, uh, why, why is data and metrics, why, why is that important in the first place? Uh, well, here's an example, Flux architecture. Um, so why does, was, why does data tell you so much more than code? Well, this is what your architecture looks like on paper. Maybe it looks something like this. 
Uh, but most people, they come into your company, they learn as much as possible. They learn, or really they learn what's necessary to get the job done. And they treat everything else as a black box. So even though this is what that, the, your architecture looks like on paper, this is what your API expert often sees. They're really familiar with the API layer, but maybe not as much on the client. And it doesn't mean they don't know anything about web browsers or mobile. It doesn't mean they don't know how the system works. Uh, but it does mean that they're not able to reason about perf effectively. Here's what your product expert might see. Again, a bunch of black boxes. And then areas where there's light, they're really effective. And everywhere else, they kind of struggle. Um, and finally, here's what your, that should say perf expert. So when you work on perf, you end up seeing a lot of different parts of the system. And maybe you have a lot of expertise in parts and a passing familiarity with a lot of other parts. Uh, so you're probably more effective at thinking about performance, but still, you're not an expert in every part of the system. So how can you approach performance problems holistically? It's really difficult. Uh, so data is really important because it can shed light on those black boxes. Uh, it really, you know, it really gets beyond those by capturing the, the behavior of your system in production um, without, without being too granular. It gives you exactly what you need. And I'll, I'll expand on that in a moment. Uh, so first, let's talk about choosing the right metrics. It can be, it can be somewhat daunting, but I'll share what's worked for me. Um, so the first thing I like to do is attempt to approximate user value. Um, you know, of all the metrics you choose, there are only a few that actually correlate to business metrics or correlate to a good user experience. Um, and the reason for this is when other people in the org come to you and ask you, you know, why'd you choose that metric or why are you working on what you're working on? You want them to walk away understanding the connection, not just to users, but to their work. Because pretty much everyone else is focused directly on user value. Um, even if you look at other infrastructure teams like, you know, reliability, that's how often are, is, are users having a good experience. Efficiency, that's how much money are we spending. With performance, sometimes there is a fuzzy relationship between your work and business metrics. So that's one reason. Um, so I want to talk about two popular perf metrics. So one is called time to interact. Uh, I really like this one. I think it does a great job of approximating user value. Uh, so when we say time to interact, that's really the time it takes to render a page where when you click, you'll see immediate feedback. So it doesn't mean I click and I see, you know, a fully rendered response. I click on a photo, I see it, a big version right away. But at least when I click, I should see a throbber. It's hooking up just enough to make it feel like a real app. Um, so TTI is great because when TTI moves, business metrics tend to move. If the page isn't interactive, I try to click on something, I'm probably going to leave, right? We, we don't have time to waste. Um, so another one I'll share is E2E, end to end time. It's another popular one. And this is usually just the entire page load time. So on its surface, this actually looks like a pretty good perf metric, right? It captures everything. But the problem is that it's a much better uh, measure of technical quality than it is of user value, value for the user. So what I mean is that, you know, there, there are situations where the page will be interactive and you'll load, let's say, you know, 500K a megabyte more JavaScript. And getting rid of that last 500K a megabyte doesn't make a difference for the user experience because the page was already interactive. And that might be a little bit counterintuitive. And it also probably doesn't apply to every single app. But for most apps, E2E isn't going to be the best measure of value for the user. Um, so back to how to choose the right metric. So I talked about approximating user value. Um, the other thing I want to touch on is, uh, you know, how you set perf goals. So lots of times it may be tempting to use an average. I think that's the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of us. We want to understand a data set really well. You know, just take the average. That'll tell you a lot about it. Uh, and sometimes that's true. So it's true when your data set adheres to a normal distribution. When your data set adheres to a normal distribution, the average is basically the number that's right in the middle. 50% of the values are below that number, 50% are higher. So it actually does tell you a lot about your data. But if you've worked on performance at all, you know your data sets don't look anything like this. They look more like this. Actually, they look nothing like this. Every data set looks different, but the point is that um, it's not a normal distribution. So what I like to do is use percentiles. Percentiles, even though it's just a single number, that actually gives you a lot of information about the distribution of the data. So why is that important? That allows you to make a much more precise statement about what's happening in production. If I have you know, an average page load time of four seconds, I can't state with any degree of confidence 
how many people are experiencing below four seconds, above four seconds, whatever. If I have a P75 time of four seconds, that literally means, by definition, that means 75% uh, of page loads are four seconds or faster. And that's just a much stronger statement, and it keeps your team intellectually honest. And then when people come to you and ask you, why do you have this metric? Then there's no, there's no way to poke holes in it. Maybe they can argue that percentile should be higher, but you can't really poke holes in that. Uh, the other thing to note is that when you choose percentiles, they're actually way more sensitive than averages. And I'm actually going to go back a few slides. Uh, well, I'll explain what's happening here really quickly. Um, so you can see there's this red line at the top, and that's really spiky, and then uh, or really volatile rather. And you see, then you see an orange line at the bottom. So the red line at the top is P90 for this data set, and the orange line at the bottom is the average. What's happening here is that when the distribution changes above the average and only above the average, then that's going to affect higher percentiles, but it's not going to affect the average quite as much. And let me go back a few slides to this bell curve. So again, if, if the distribution of your data is changing above the average a lot, but not below the average or near the average, then that average isn't going to move that much. But it should, right? Like a good perf metric, when something goes wrong, it should move, right? Uh, but it turns out averages often can be deceiving for that reason. So that's why I love to use percentiles. Um, so the third thing I'll do is that, and this, and this may feel a bit obvious, in addition to approximating user value and using percentiles, you also want to log correlative metrics. What are the things that tend to correlate with movements in perf? A really good example is uh, the number of megabytes returned from your data store. That's something you would probably never set a goal on because it relates to value for the user. Uh, but it does correlate to something interesting happening. And that's going to be really interesting when, uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how you work with other teams, but that's going to be really interesting when you want to distribute work to the right teams or you're doing a regression investigation. That's the type of thing you're going to wish you had, uh, wish, you, you, wish you'd added like months prior. Oh, got it. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so that was, that was choosing the right metrics. Now let's talk about how to reason about your data. Um, so I spoke about the importance of this earlier, uh, but just touch, to touch on it again, uh, you know, when you, when you spend a lot of time reading through code, you do get a, a really granular perspective on what's happening when you load the page. But the first thing to note is that reading code is really time consuming, right? To understand a system that could take half a day, a day, maybe even a week for something really complex, a uh, really interconnected system with several subsystems, it's really time consuming but also institutional knowledge tends to decay, especially if you're working on a really large shared code base. You could look at the same code in three months and it'll be completely different, refactored, deprecated, whatever. So data is a little bit more enduring, or at least the approach of using data allows you to kind of learn once and, and use that knowledge for a while. So anyway, before uh, talking about reasoning about data, let's do a, a really quick refresher on graphs. So the first one is, whoop, First one, I'll talk about is a time series. So with the time series, you have time on the x-axis, you have your metric on the y-axis. And this is really great, obviously, for seeing how your metric changes over time. But it's also really great for correlating other events on the site with changes in performance. So the time series is one of those really basic graphs in your performance tool set. Second one I'll talk about is a histogram. So a histogram is really useful for seeing the frequency of different observations. So for example, in this histogram, uh, we can tell that the most common height for people in this data set is somewhere between 150 and 160. It's like 155. You can tell that at a glance. So you can see why this is really beautiful for Perf. You, you quickly can understand uh, what the experience of your users is. Uh, the last one I'll touch on is the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. So the CDF is really nice because basically allows you to see um, what you know, at a given percentile, what is the user experience? Or rather, you know, for a given percentile, uh, well, how do I phrase this? Uh, so for P, you know, I mentioned the P75 example earlier. Uh, it'll tell you at a glance how many people are at that value or lower. So if it's P75, actually, sorry, let me step. Or if it's P67 uh, and the height is 165, that's telling you at a glance that for, for this data set, 
67% of people were 155 centimeters, or, or sorry, 165 centimeters or shorter. And again, that's really useful for performance. So let's, uh, let's talk about a few patterns that are really useful. These are patterns that I like to look for, um, usually at the beginning of a performance investigation, or if I see these patterns, uh, I can pretty quickly tell what's going on. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna do this as an interactive exercise, so I'll give you, a, give you guys a chance to guess what's going on. Um, so with this graph, we see a gradual increase. Uh, I tell you that there's, there's no corresponding increase in system load. And there's no difference across demographics. This graph looks exactly the same forever. So this is a pretty typical graph that you might see. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys think is going on here? Could, that's, that's a good one, actually. It could be, are you, are you thinking memory leak or just JVM sucking? OK. OK. It could be a memory leak. That's a good one. That's a good one. What was that? Yeah. That's a great one. Not what I had in mind. So this is an increase over days or weeks. And I, I suppose for a, you know, a long running process, that could definitely be the case. Again, there's, there's no real right answer. That was a very good answer. Um, that, that could be it. But there's no corresponding increase in system load. I'm, I'm going to give you guys an answer. These are all good ideas, though. So this, at least, you know, it, it kind of depends on the org, right? But if you're working on a really big shared code base, you're trying to figure out, like, what event could have caused this. Lots of times, this is indicative of, of a slow rollout, you know. Pretty common pattern where somebody opens a feature flag, they open it 10%, 20%, 50%. It's just kind of arbitrary, right? There's no science to it. Um, and they're not telling anyone. Or maybe they tell a few people, but they don't know who to talk to, really, in a really big company. Um, so oftentimes, that's exactly what's happening. And they're not trying to do anything wrong. And in fact, they're re being really careful, and they're driving the perf team crazy. Um, so that's one pattern I've seen quite a bit. Uh, so the second one is, is something I'll call a blip. Uh, so with the blip, it's a, it's a regression that looks like noise initially when you're kind of zoomed in really tight. Um, but then when you zoom out, let's say to week over week, you see a periodic regression. So you can see several spikes, and this is meant to be over the course of weeks. Uh, and then there's no correlation with app usage. App usage isn't going up and down with the same pattern. So what, what's going on here? Schedule jobs. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty close to what I had in mind, actually. Um, so it is, it, oh. it, could, it could be, it could be, uh, but there's no correlation with app usage in this case. Yeah, yeah. Um, so scheduled jobs is actually pretty similar to what I had in mind. Uh, so I've often seen this, you know, when you have a, a cold warm start dynamic. For example, when you push a new version of your web app and you have, you know, a giant JavaScript bundle that you're asking a bunch of users to download, you do see this type of behavior. Same with mobile apps when you, you, know, you ship a new version. People are doing what's called a cold start, loading all the code back into memory, restarting processes. Um, this is exactly what you see. But I like to share this example because you'll see all sorts of blips. And it's important not to treat those as random noise, but to really dig in and understand what is going on. Um, but also periodic jobs, uh, that's a great one. Really, it's just there's some, there's some human problem going on in there that's happening periodically. Garbage, that could be garbage collection as well, although I think I would expect, well, yeah, I won't overanalyze this one. Um, so th the next thing I'll talk about is, uh, you know, a bimodal distribution. Um, so you look at your histogram, and it re reveals multiple modes. It could be two, it could be three, it could be more. There's no pattern when slicing by demographic. You see this exact same pattern for everyone. Um, so what's going on here? Could be an A-B test. Yeah. So, yeah, more generally what I had in mind is it, it indicates that there's a really expensive code path, essentially, right? So you can almost envision a conditional in your code. One path invokes some API that's really expensive. Another path invokes, a, you know, a much cheaper option. So when you're reading the code, it's really hard to see what's going on. You won't get this, this density of information about the behavior in production. When you look at the data, it becomes crystal clear. And if this is just measuring performance for one part of my page, then that's a huge hint into potential optimizations. Um, so this is the last one. So this is the cumulative. Oh, oh interesting. One has too much load. Yeah, that's a, so uh, what was your name? Sai. So Sai mentioned that this could also be indicative of false, faulty load balancing, where one, one node is getting way too much, the other one's getting less. Well, that, that's, that's a good point, yeah. The frequency would probably be lower in one, but yeah, still a good point. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, interesting. You mean like, yeah, desktop web, mobile web? Yeah, no, that, that's another good one. And then, you know, lots of times you do want to slice and dice by demographic data. It could be platform. It could be country. Uh, you know, lots of countries have, you know, much poorer network infrastructure. Um, I see a hand. I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, um, so this is the last one. So cumulative distribution function, extreme outliers. So the CDF levels off sharply at P99. So in case you're not familiar with this graph, when there's a leveling off, that's actually a sharp increase because uh, performance is on the x-axis. So at P99, we see a sharp increase. When we look at P, excuse me, P99.9, it increases even more. So my first question is, what's broken? What do, what do you guys think is going on? So this is often an indication of a big fish or celebrity problem. You have a few users who are experiencing insanely bad performance. And at first glance, it looks like, you know, maybe you have a zombie process or something crazy like that lurking somewhere in your infrastructure. But actually what's happening is these are real people having really crappy experiences. And it may seem like that doesn't matter, especially when you get to P99.9. .9, but sometimes those people are the ones with enough influence to actually cause those infrastructure problems in the first place, which often means you should be prioritizing. Uh, when I was at Facebook, we actually had a Bieber cluster. And the Bieber cluster was what we used to make sure that all of Justin Bieber's fans had a relatively good user experience. So this does happen quite often, um, depending on the type of app. Wow, indeed. <laughs> um, all right, next. Uh, so, no, I don't, I don't think it was really that. I, I think, uh, you know, it wasn't that no one knew things were being released. It was more that people weren't keeping an eye on Perf for a while. Like, they... The quick anecdote is that they had a really great perf team who did literally revolutionary work, and they're like, nothing else to do. The site's fast now. <laughs> so they spun down the team, and then they spun it back up when I was there. So I had the privilege of cleaning up years of mess. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was more just like not having a strong uh, perf presence. Um, so how do you how do you build the right tools? I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this section quickly, but but raise your hand if you have questions. So you can build a lot of different tools, right? You sit down, you look at a mystery graph or somebody asks you to speed up a product. How do you, how do you build the, the tool that's gonna help you um, help yourself and, and help everyone else find performance optimizations really quickly? Here's how I approach it. So first I, I consider the many tool types I could build. So there are static ana analyzers, which allow us to make inferences about how code will behave in production. There are profilers, which actually run at runtime collect data and tell you what's actually happening now. And then there are what's called predictive modelers, and these are more rare. But basically, these allow you to ask what if questions. What if I roll out this feature? What if I introduce this piece of infrastructure? There aren't that many that I'm aware of that exist like that, uh, but they're quite powerful. Uh, the key thing to note here is that you almost always want a predictive modeler. It's, it's, it's the most powerful tool, but they're insanely hard to build, so it's not always feasible. So the next thing I consider is the developer workflow. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share an example workflow. You can get arbitrarily granular here. Uh, so you develop in Sandbox, you run your test suite, you push the staging, and then you push the prod. So the thing to note here is that it's always better to give people the information as soon as possible. It may only be feasible to give it to them later, but it's always better to give them the information as soon as possible. So that's the second thing I consider. Uh, oh, the other thing to note here is that each one of these stages is an opportunity to give people information about the perf implications of their code. Uh, so the last thing I consider is the stages in the rendering pipeline. And here's an example, a uh, pretty common example. So you have your DB query, you're waiting for that to return. Um, you have server CPU, that's the time spent processing that response. You have the network time spent sending the response to the client. And then you have the client CPU time spent processing that server response. Okay, so why am I explaining all this to you? So you have three tool types. You have four steps in your dev workflow. You have four steps in the rendering pipeline. That's up to 48 possible tools that you could be building, right? And I think this is perhaps subconsciously when people look at perf problems, this is kind of what's going on in the back of your head. You, you think of all these possibilities and it's like, where do I start? And you know, you kind of give it your best shot. So how do I like to prioritize tools? Uh, so first, I like to sort by time spent on the critical path. So for example, if server CPU is dominating the critical path, I'm going to prioritize all the tools for server CPU first. 
Then I like to sort by stage in the developer workflow, right? So ideally, you know, I, I actually start at work whiteboarding when I think of my developer workflow. I would love to have a tool for server CPU uh, that works when I'm whiteboarding, ideally. I'm not saying we can get there, it's the ideal though. Um, sort by stages of the developer workflow, and finally sort by tool type. And again, the ideal in this scenario is a tool that gives me, uh, that predicts how my, the code that I'm writing on the whiteboard is gonna behave, right? That's the ideal tool in this scenario that I just described. Um, so after all that sorting, you throw out the moonshots or the, the ideas that are infeasible. So unfortunately, we're not gonna write a whiteboard predictive modeler because that's insanely infeasible. But you get, a, you get a few clicks down the lists and the first thing that feels pretty feasible is the first thing you should build. So I put this together because, you know, I was, I was managing this tools team at Facebook. They were having trouble kind of trying to prioritize what tools to build and they were getting a lot of incoming requests. So this is a really nice data-driven way that you can approach tools prioritization. Um, so moving away from tooling, um, I wanna talk about building alignment. Um, so actually, before I move on, were there any other questions about telemetry and tooling? Or? Okay, all right. So building alignment is more on the people side. How do you get people to work together effectively on this stuff? Um, so first I wanna talk about the importance of a common language and what that looks like. So why is this even important? Uh, so have you guys ever had this experience where you're trying to talk to your company's perf expert and you can't make heads or tails of what they're saying? Or actually, this is probably the wrong audience. Have you guys ever been the perf expert and you're trying to explain to other people the value of your work and how things work and they just, yeah, I see one hand at least, I saw one nod. Um, I'll raise my hand too, this happens all the time. I've actually joined a, a perf effort that was two or three years old and no one understood what the, the leader uh, of the effort was actually saying. Um, so at times performance, you know, it requires you to reason about metrics and subsystems and ideas that you don't have to think about anywhere else, right? So you haven't had a chance to converge on a shared terminology, which is something we don't think about a lot because it happens organically. We come together on a product team and we have our goals, that's pretty clear. And everything else, you know, sometimes you say two different words, you're like, oh, what should we call it, right? You've all had that experience. The thing with performance is that in a single sentence, you could have three, four, five different terms that are performance specific, so that organic approach doesn't work quite as well. So this is important to get right because, uh, well, um, this is important to get right because if you don't get it right, over time, you're just gonna have a loss of, of, of trust in both directions. Your perf expert is gonna think everyone else is an idiot, and everyone else is gonna think your perf expert is an idiot, or at the very least, confused. Uh, so here's an example, We're gonna, this is another interactive portion. So this is a screenshot from Chrome DevTools and there's a big red arrow pointing, I don't know if you guys can read that, but it's a network request for arm.js. So what, what do you guys call that, that row, arm.js? Just raise your hand. Network requests, okay. Resource, network trace, so I'm gonna show you three possibilities. Raise your hand if you would call it a JS file. Raise, uh, we don't have to do this exercise anyway. The point is that you could call it a lot of different things. And in the course of a conversation, this type of thing matters. It seems subtle, but if I'm saying static asset, which could be JavaScript, it could be CSS, it could be images, and you're saying JavaScript bundle, we're gonna walk away from that conversation confused and misaligned. And I've seen it happen over and over again, again, even for mature perf efforts. Um, and that makes it, again, insanely difficult to converge organically and quickly on a shared terminology. Um, so what are the primary things people even wanna understand when they're talking about perf? So there's why is perf degrading or improving? Um, whoops, sorry. There's uh, um, how, does, how does a given optimization improve performance? Like what are, the, what are the underlying mechanics? And then there's how is perf work prioritized? These are the most these are the most common things, uh, at least anecdotally speaking, these are the most common things that I've seen being discussed. So it's a pretty constrained set of questions, right? So how do you get people speaking the same language? Well, what I've done is I've defined a perf grammar. And this, the perf grammar is gonna depend on the company and the specific problems you're solving, but this can be a really effective way to get people aligned like that. 
Um, so here's an example of what I mean. A potential perf grammar could be the magnitude of the change, for example, plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 100 milliseconds. Um, the, the sequence, and by sequence I mean is it critical path, is it total time, is it something else? Uh, the percentile, or it could, could even be average. Uh, ag probably aggregation method is a good way to sum that, but percentile, average, P90, P95. Uh, and then finally, the stage of work. What part of the stack or what stage of the rendering pipeline are we talking about here? So here's an example. Negative 100 milliseconds, P75, critical path client CPU. There are literally thousands of different ways you could describe this. And it's really helpful, especially when you're talking to people outside of your perf team, to just have one true way to do it. Um, in fact, if you ask 10 people how to, you know, describe this in 10 minutes, I bet you get 10 different answers. Um, so simply defining the grammar is obviously just the beginning. You have to constantly correct people. You have to publish documentation, but you'd be surprised. Pretty quickly, people get that if they want to converse with the perf team, or if they want to understand what's going on, they have to learn this grammar. It's very simple, right? Uh, simple, but very effective. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is demonstrating your impact to the rest of the org. Um, you, know, I, you know, I think even Sergey touched on it earlier. It's, it is really important to prove your worth. I think people have this intuitive sense that performance is really important. But when rubber hits road, they don't always prioritize it. Um, even if people assume that perfect improvements are going to improve revenue, for example, you know, they might ask, but does it really improve revenue? How much? And... Does that improvement justify, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity cost of not allocating you guys to work on something else? These are the types of conversations that happen daily, even during a successful perf effort. So what you really want is an apples to apples comparison. And here are a few ways I've accomplished that in the past. Um, so you can literally just display the page load time, build a custom UI, display the page load time. Um, and for anyone who's perf obsessed, every time they load the page, their eyes are gonna drift, right? And when your perf team improves that number, even if they can't feel that improvement, they're still gonna have uh, a tangible sign of your perf team's work. So that's probably the most simple thing you can do. The second most simple thing you can do is share write-ups from other companies or books. There are a lot of great books that talk about the importance of performance and the relationship to revenue. Um, so the third thing that a lot of companies actually don't do is A-B test your optimizations. And sometimes people don't do this because it's, it's, it can be tedious. For example, if you're adding uh, like the DNS preload tag, like how do you even A-B test that in your stack? It's not, your, no stack is designed to do that. So it is a little bit painful. Um, but if you can demonstrate, that's a bad example because it probably wouldn't have an impact on business metrics. But if you can demonstrate uh, the business metrics moving uh, when you ship those experiments, that's a, that's a really powerful demonstration of your team's value. Um, so the final one, and the one I'm going to do a bit of elaboration on is conducting your own studies. Uh, how many of you guys have tried to do this with performance? Yeah, exactly. That's why you need a grammar, see? Um, so yeah, let me, I'll, I'll talk about the ways that I've approached this problem in the past. Um, so the first is kind of a naive approach. So you can bucket sessions into perf classes. So for example, I can look at all the users that experience less than two seconds TTI and all the users that experience greater than two seconds TTI. I can look at business metrics for those groups of users. And then I can infer a causal relationship between performance and business metrics, right? Um, so there's a pretty big downside with this, though. Can, can anyone tell me what that is? Exactly, exactly. Um, so you may be misled into inferring a causal relationship where none exists. So for example, if you're experiencing greater TTI, uh, it could be that, or sorry, if you're, if, you know, you're experiencing um, if, you know, if, you, if you're experiencing greater TTI and your engagement is worse, um, it could be that the performance is causing degraded engagement. Uh, but it could also be that there are just socioeconomic factors that are affecting both. Um, revenue is an even better example. So you know, in countries that have poor network infrastructure, you know, those, are, those are countries that also have radically different spending habits in the United States. So naturally, revenue would be lower and performance would be worse. It doesn't mean there's a causal relationship. So lots of times when you do this type of bucketing, you'll get a really misleading answer. Um, so the second approach that I'll cover, uh, and I've used this one quite a bit, is called uh, artificial perf manipulation. Uh, so you introduce an artificial perf regression or improvement 
measure the differences between control and experiment groups, and then you infer your causal relationship. Um, simple enough, and it does solve for the downsides of the previous approach. Um, so you, can you guys think of uh, downsides for this approach? I mean, there's one obvious one. You're hurting the UX intentionally, and there are a lot of companies that aren't going to let you do that. But the other thing is that you're inferring a linear relationship where there isn't one. So sometimes that's okay, right? If you're just saying, you know, when performance improves by 10%, revenue in increases by 1%. If you just want to make that statement, fine. But if you want to say when performance improves by 20%, revenue improves by 2%, nope. Your data didn't tell you that because you don't know if the relationship is linear. Um, so it's important to be careful with that. Uh, and the last thing I'll cover is uh, the long-term holdout group, which might be what you're referring to. Um, so for a, push, a portion of your users, just don't ship any optimizations for a while. Uh, review the business metrics after several weeks or months, and then infer your causal relationship between perf and business metrics. Um, so this actually works really well, and it's pretty versatile. You know, if uh, it does have the, the straightforward approach does have that same problem, where you know you might see a linear relationship uh, and be misled there. But you can just you can create multiple holdout groups, and in theory you can come out with a nice curve. Um, that describes the relationship pretty well. Uh, so the, the, the only downside actually that I can think of anyway is that this is potentially very complex to implement and it's pretty painful. Um, and one reason is that most stacks aren't designed for this, but the other thing to note is that sometimes when you ship a perfect experiment, it's actually just a UI change. And then you're mixing, uh, you're mixing a product change with a performance change. And then that hurts your, ultimately that's gonna hurt your understanding of whether it's performance that's making a difference or whether it's just the UX change that's making a difference for engagement. A great example is a, you know, a carousel. Um, oftentimes on a carousel, you'll load a lot of the data optimistically. And a really basic optimization is just only load the things that are showing up at first, right? So you're shifting time from initial render to interaction. And sure, that, that's gonna have an impact on, on engagement one way or another, right? Because either people interact with it more because it's faster or less because that, you know, when they interact with it, it takes more time to see more content. And you really don't know which is which with this approach. So you do have to be careful and perhaps you can just filter out all the UI changes, but yeah, this is, that's, that's another downside of that approach. Um, okay, so moving on to cultivating a performance culture, uh, which I know is a bit of a vague phrase. So uh, what is a healthy culture of managing app performance? look like any ideas uh-huh so when you have kpis that you're tracking giving weekly status updates or periodic static status updates that's a good one as well uh, no. baseline awareness of what not to do that's a good one. Oh, that was a great answer you've thought about this before um, yeah so there's no right answer here so I'm, I'm gonna give you my answer um, I think with a healthy culture of managing app performance, uh, people have a shared definition for and approach to achieving excellence. Everyone knows what excellence looks like with performance. And everyone understands how to get there. It is really hard to build that type of culture, but when you have that, then things become a lot easier. Um, so expanding on this a little bit, how, how do we get there? So I think the first step is really clear ownership. So there are oftentimes is an assumption that the central perf team, the thought leaders, should be the ones that promote performance. Uh, but that over, almost never works. It's not a sustainable approach. Um, and really what you want is domain expertise to pool in the right places so that you can distribute that work ultimately. Uh, the other thing is prioritization. How do you know when performance is bad enough to actually focus on it? This is a really hard question to answer. Um, I've always wanted to try to come up with a perf budget, but I've never done it on any of the performance efforts I've been a part of. So oftentimes it's, it's a very top-down approach. You know, I mentioned the example earlier of the CEO just seeing slow page loads and telling everyone to work on perf. It happens over and over again. It's hard to, to teach people how to prioritize perf. Um, the other one is just having tooling and documentation. And this is a pretty straightforward thing, right? Uh, you want to give people the resources they need to understand root causes really quickly. Um, and the final thing, perhaps most important, is levers for controlling perf. And this is what a lot of stacks are missing. So I have the tools, I have the documentation, I know what the root cause is, but I have no idea how to fix it because we've, you know, either you, the org has coded itself into a corner for a particular problem, um, 
or it's just, it's gonna take too many changes for code I don't own. There, there are a lot of reasons this can happen, but it makes no difference if I know the problem, if I can't actually fix the problem, and especially if I can't fix it easily. Um, so, you know, I share all these because these are things that really frustrate people when you try to ask them to work on Earth. And the only way to build a really healthy culture of managing app performance is to build allies. That's really what you're out to do. If you're on a central Perf team. You want to be an advocate for Perf and build allies and find people that are going to help you make the, make the site fast and awesome. Um, these are the things that, I don't know if you guys can see that text, but these are the things that create adversaries. If you have unclear priorities, if you have lack of education, or if you have lack of tooling, you're going to create adversaries. It's not enough to have two out of three of these. You actually need all of them. Because if you don't have all of them, people are going to get stuck or they're going to waste time and tasks will feel impossible, um, or at least they'll, 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 they'll feel uh, more time consuming than necessary. So when I think about cultivating that culture, it's about having the shared priorities, it's about having uh, performance education, and it's about having the data, tools, and APIs. And that will naturally give you allies. People love teams that make it really easy for them to have an impact. If I go to product engineers and I say, hey, you can increase engagement simply by invoking this API. And oh, anytime you see performance uh, regress uh, with this pattern, just use this API. Who's not gonna do that? Um, and once, you know, I'll talk a little bit about architecture in a moment, but once you have the right architecture, it really is that easy. People love uh, teams that make it easy to have an effect. Yeah, so Sai was, Sai was talking about interleaving performance sprints with feature sprints, uh, which, which I think can work really well. I, I, you know, I would hope that ultimately somebody figures out how to avoid that, right? Um, but, ult but ultimately, yeah, you're right. Like, no architecture is going to prevent, you know, performance from degrading. You can only slow, slow down that degradation. Um, so the final thing I want to talk about is how you define that North Star for your performance teams. Um, so for a lot of people, you know, we, we touched on this earlier, performance work, you know, it's not inherently rewarding. Uh, when you achieve the goal, there isn't really anything tangible you can point to. There isn't a TechCrunch article or whatever kids are reading these days. There isn't, you know, a component you can point to on the website. Um, all you have is your number. <laughs> all you have is your number. It's a little sad, actually. Um, you know, as a result, perf teams are often spun up and down. Because that, that number isn't compelling to anyone. It's not compelling to the team oftentimes. It's not compelling to managers, VPs, CEOs. Um, so it feels like, it often feels like an ad hoc, you know, firefighting team that's spun up again and again. Um, so this, this also makes hiring really difficult. No one wants to join a team like that. So anyway, healthy perf teams really need a North Star in order to, you know, stay motivated, in order to make sure they're not just focusing on short-term tactical work. Again, how do you, how do you keep sites fast? So I want to talk about, um, you know, two ways that, that have worked for me for defining that North Star. Uh, so one is having a really sound architecture strategy overall, really empowering the perf team to own that. Uh, and the second thing I'll touch on is team mission and how I think about team mission for perf teams. Um, so, you know, the first thing I want to share uh, when I reason about perf and, you know, thinking about how to keep sites fast, I really find the notion of perf cost per incremental feature really useful. And this isn't always an exact thing can't say if I add this button, perf is going to degrade this much. Um, but you can think about it in relative terms. And I'm going to show you a really useful diagram in a sec. But the idea is that when you add a feature to the site using whatever architecture, whether it's React or traditional you know, shipping HTML markup or whatever it is, when you add that feature, you want to understand the impact across the stack. What's the impact on server CPU? What's the impact on network time, client CPU? And you can even get more granular than that. Um, next, you want to think about you know, how to minimize that cost per incremental feature. And, you know, sometimes it's a matter of thinking of novel architectures you can land. Sometimes it's just a matter of looking at the solutions available and thinking about which one minimizes that cost. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the next thing you want to think about when you're making your technology decisions. So you use that as a lens. Uh, and the final thing I've, I've found really useful, or second to last thing I found really useful when thinking about um, keeping sites fast and, and thinking about architecture strategy is giving engineers control, some control over that rendering pipeline. So when you're trying to make something fast, you can eliminate work, right? 
which oftentimes just corresponds to killing a feature, but it's a lot easier to just move that work somewhere else, just defer it or lower the priority, depending on how your system works. So if you can offer people a sane set of APIs to do that, especially in a shared code base, that can be, that can be a really powerful abstraction. Um, so the final thing I'll say is pair parallelize. And this isn't meant to be as glib as it sounds. Basically what I'm saying here is devise an architecture where worst case, you can pay or parallelize to make it faster. Um, I'm gonna talk about how Facebook is thinking about that in just a moment. Um, so this is, uh, this is an example of how you might visualize that perf cost per feature. Um, so this is, a, this is a diagram that I used when I was at Facebook to explain to people the difference between shipping HTML markup and shipping React. So I don't have the HTML markup version handy, but it's really useful for seeing, relatively speaking, how your features are gonna behave. So in this example, if I had the traditional slide handy, you'd see much smaller CPU or client CPU time. And the key insight here is, uh, you know, we're working on homepage performance. And I was trying to tell people, look, if we keep converting things to React, the homepage is just gonna get slower. Here's why, right? There was, you know, there was no data that would help people understand this. Um, even showing them like a perf regression for an experiment, there could be a million reasons. But to me, this was like 100% common sense, right? Uh, so it took about a year, and then perf got bad enough that we actually started converting things back. And that actually ended up being one of the most effective ways to tune perf for the homepage. And I like to bring up this example because everyone's converting to React. I love React too. Functional reactive programming is nothing short of revolutionary for stateful UIs. But you have to be thinking about how this scales with each feature you add. And I'm not saying these are insurmountable hurdles, but still, lots of people are using the naive approach and not paying attention to performance. Um, okay, so going back to you know this idea I shared where you give engineers control over the rendering pipeline. Um, so Facebook uses an abstraction called Big Pipe, which basically manages a rendering pipeline for different parts of the page. The page is split into several parts uh, called pagelets. That's what each one of these rectangles are. So there are two important things to note. Um, every one of these pagelets has a priority. So newsfeed is, is one of the highest priorities because um, that's you know, what most people are coming to this site for. Um, and then every page has you know, several stages of the rendering pipeline, whether it's you know, requesting data, server CPU, et cetera. It gets arbitrarily granular. Um, so what BigPipe does is it, co it coordinates scheduling that work in order to render this entire page. So for example, at the beginning, the newsfeed database query is highest priority. And then if it comes back quickly enough, the newsfeed server CPU will be prioritized. But if it doesn't come back quickly, the second highest priority thing will be prioritized. It's a beautiful abstraction, and I encourage you to read more about it. I wish more people were using it. The really nice thing here is that if I want to change the priority, it's literally just one line of code. If I want to require something for display, meaning required for TTI, time to interact, that's literally one line of code. If I want to defer it to after TTI, one line of code. So what Facebook got right here for managing performance on this shared code base is giving product engineers really granular control over prioritization of work on the rendering pipeline. And that means that you know, when you give people tools to actually find these root causes, they're literally landing one line changes to optimize the products, you know, in the 80% case, the 20% case, they come talk to the first. Um, so I definitely encourage you guys to look up Big Pipe. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you think about team mission? Because a lot of perf teams don't. A lot of perf teams, again, they're just firefighting squads. So once you have alignment with the rest of the org, uh, hopefully you've convinced people to start helping with perf. You know, you have enough cycles to figure out what to do next. And if you're like me and you wanna work on perf indefinitely, uh, then you start trying to justify your work to the rest of the org. Um, so there are several things that I like to focus on when I think about team mission for perf. So one is empowering other engineers. Hey, you guys, you know, you have great tools now, but we're gonna encounter novel challenges. You guys are gonna need us to build more tools, continue iterating on the education. Second, the perf team as the thought leaders, they should really be working on the hardest problems. 
Um, I think the incentives are aligned, right? As a perf engineer, I want to be working on those problems. As a product engineer, I don't want to be working on those problems. So incentives are aligned with that as well. Um, I touched on it, minimizing perf cost for incremental feature. And this is really uh, about the perf team owning that long-term architectural strategy that's going to keep the site fast. Um, and then the last one, I actually think this is by far the most important. The last one is focusing on the big picture. Uh, a perf team shouldn't, in my opinion, be about just keeping one site fast because perf work does require so much investigation. You are unlocking so much knowledge. Uh, for me, when I would recruit people to the team, I told them if we do our jobs well, we'll make the entire web faster. It happens to be true for Facebook because they are encountering a lot of novel problems, but why not your companies? Um, I think that for most performance efforts, you actually are encountering novel problems. And if you put the time in, you'll unlock some pretty cool knowledge that you can you know, contribute back to the public knowledge base. So not only is that just like a really big motivating vision, it's actually really good for the company too, right? Um, you know, have your perf team make an industry impact, share that impact. It helps with recruiting across the board, but it also creates a perf team that's way more fun to work on. So that's how I like to think about it. Um, so that, summing it all up, uh, you know, I talked about tips for telemetry and tooling. I talked about how to align several different teams. And finally, I just talked about defining a North Star for your team. Um, so I, I hope that following these strategies will help you make the entire web faster. I think that's really the exciting part of Perf. So let's get to it. Let's go make the entire web faster. Um, so yeah, I hope you found this talk useful. I'm going to leave my email address up here in case you guys have any other questions after tonight. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll open it up to Q&A. So if you could rewind the web 20 years, you know, before all of this Cambrian explosion happened and JavaScript came in and dominated and all of that stuff, like what would you do different uh, to make the internet more perf friendly? Um, That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, I, think, I think two things. Uh, I think functional reactive is great. Uh, or more, I think it's more about uh, the declarative nature of it um, because you can, you can land optimizations under the hood without requiring people to change their code. Um, so naturally, the entire web should get faster without having to introduce new APIs. I mean, it's not quite that simple because every abstraction is leaky, but I think that could be a good start. Um, yeah, I think more control over the caching layer and service workers is getting us closer, but I actually haven't seen a really great service workers implementation yet. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I'm not looking hard enough, but I want to see that implementation where, you know, it implements some magical cache that makes every website like a thousand times faster. That's what I'm waiting for. But if people had more control of the browser cache, I mean, you'd be surprised. I've had conversations with some browser developers about how they think about browser cache, and it, it, there's no real science to it. I mean, or at least not, it's not hard science. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's highly based on anecdotes and limited data sets. Uh, why, why should it be up to Chrome or Firefox to determine the cache limit? That's, that's kind of insane to me. Um, yeah, I, I almost want to say the web should be more like desktop software, but I'm not going to go quite that far. Um, but certainly in terms of, you know, being able to install resources and control cache and validation in a more granular way, uh, that's something that would have made the web a vastly different place, you know. I actually have uh, somewhat related to the previous one. So uh, you mentioned education. Um, how would you go about doing, uh, doing so? Because what you just mentioned, that caching, right? We could have had granular this or that. Well, technology existed like, well, I wrote an article about 10 years ago about it, right? Like, that was what, I, what I, was, I mentioned before, but people don't seem to know, right? So not specifically about caching, but generally education about performance, what would we do? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, I thought it was kind of funny when you brought that up because literally per every perf effort I've worked on, the first thing I said was go look at uh, high performance websites. That, that The classic book, it has like 10 pieces of very obvious advice at this point, but most people don't do it. I almost included that in the talk, but I just felt a little silly for saying follow best practices. You know, that's pretty obvious. So yeah, I think, I think just saying read these books is actually pretty effective. But one thing I've found hugely important for Perf is writing a ton of documentation and actually going back a little bit to this diagram. 
you know, I mentioned I put this diagram together and several others like it just to give people a really high level conceptual understanding of the perf implications of the technology decisions that they were making. Um, this type of visual aid was really effective, but I got a lot more granular and wrote a lot of docs about how Facebook's rendering pipeline worked. Um, you'd be surprised, actually, if you search for a Facebook big pipe, there's a really popular article, or actually a couple of them. And if you read that article, that article is way better than the state of documentation when I started working on perf at Facebook. So documentation, I think a lot of people overlook it, but that's a way to scale out your efforts. Uh, the way I wrote it was I sat down and thought about all the things I learned, but then I just, it, was, it essentially turned into a list of frequently asked questions, just like formatted and, you know, grouped logically, but that's all it was. It was just like caching, you know, the responses I was giving people. So that's another really important one. Um, the other thing that I organized was uh, like a web performance summit. So, you know, I mentioned we, you know, we spent a lot of time building allies. And what I noticed was that I would go to people and say, hey, your thing is slow, go fix it. And they'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm gonna go ship more code and slow down the site even more. So I wrote the docs, but more importantly, I, you know, invited them to the summit. We had food, we had beer. Uh, we just walked them through everything. And we walked them through, you know, who we were as a perf team, how we saw themselves, you know, sort of interacting with them. Uh, and then we explained basically how the website works. And that was hugely effective. I mean, I think people appreciated it a lot because there was, there was no other way to get that information. And it's not that people want to do a bad job ever, right? They're just they're trying to be rational about it. They're not going to spend a week trying to solve your perf regression when they can have a lot more impact doing something else. So, yeah, those are all the things that I judge. Sounds like meetups to me. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. yeah, I mean, companies that big, they're like small cities. So you almost have to think of it that way. So you were, you were talking earlier about um, monitoring and building a tool set to monitor and uh, analyze metrics and things like that. Yeah. What would you say is the sort of the advice or equation on build versus buy for that? For example, oh, okay. using like a, a new relic or one of those things. Which is what? Yeah. You know, I have to admit I'm the wrong person to ask because uh, I've only been in build situations for that. But, you know, I've, I've played around with some of these tools and... Um, they give you good information, but, you know, it, I talked a little bit earlier about shedding light on the black box. And one way to do that is with data. Another way to do it is with a really well-built profiler or predictive model. Uh, so I think, you know, maybe you, maybe you buy it first, but ultimately building, in my opinion, is the best way to get the information you need about your stack. Uh, unless you're on, like, platform as a service or something like that you have so many custom things going on. How else are you gonna understand the you know, behavior, especially in production? Um, but I don't know, maybe, maybe there's like, a, I don't know if there are third party services that allow you to invoke some API and funnel data back to the there's, service. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, but it sounds like from what I can, cause I, I, I agree with what you said as well. I think you're, if I could sum it up, you're saying it's a hybrid strategy. Like yeah. some things you, you're, you could buy, but really you wanna build certain knowledge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Actually, another really great example. So I know Chrome has uh, code coverage tools now, but a few years ago, or a couple years ago, I guess, uh, you know, the web performance team at Facebook, we started thinking about how to help product engineers understand how much code they were pulling onto the page. You know, we have a JavaScript module system that probably looks a lot of like what you guys use um, in your projects. Um, but it's really easy to add a line of code and slow down the site, and that just shouldn't happen. Uh, so we actually built a profile, and there were two parts to it. So you could run it on a page load and see everything that was, all the modules that were loaded and initialized, but more importantly, you could see all the functions that were executed on page load. So you could tell at a glance what percentage of a module was actually being used on initial render, uh, both number of function or percentage of functions and percentage of bytes in the file. So that was really powerful, but even cooler, you could actually like plan out refactors by clicking on different files. Uh, and then it understood like, you know, the dependency tree um, and it aggregated you know, the total number of bytes we would save. Um, and that, that approach, literally, like that one tool literally took seconds off of Facebook's page load time. And, you know, at least at the time, there was just no other way to do that. There's, uh, there's something called Istanbul, which almost gets you there. But the problem with Istanbul is it, it generates file, or Istanbul, if you're not familiar, you can run your bundle through this tool and it instruments it so that you can see what functions are called, what statements are called, what, you know, I think it, you know, I think it gets as granular statements. Anyway, 
Istant Bullet generates like a 14 megabyte file, which makes it kind of infeasible, right? There are many yeah. tools, I would say, that are available out of the box. Uh, and I agree with Kwame. You want to have the tools that you control and you can actually get the numbers you want. Because usually, sorry for jumping, just oh, take for over, because usually each of those tools does something good only in one area. <laughs> with each other. Uh, sorry, you just said new relic and it triggered the reaction. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention one more tool that was homegrown at, at Facebook really quickly. Uh, so it's a tool that, you know, for it, it takes a sample of page loads and, and it records really granular data. So you can look at a page load, you can see, uh, you know, for every single database query, you can see how long it took, you can see the number of memcache bytes, uh, there's something called tau that they're using. You can see the number of bytes there. You got timing information. You got CPU time. All for just like one chunk of execution. And then for a given page load, there were literally hundreds of these chunks. And the instrumentation was, you know, added manually. Uh, but being able to pull up a page load and see exactly what happened, there's nothing more powerful than that. I'm just not sure. I mean, maybe there are tools that allow you to do that. Yeah. Sounds like New Relic could be one, of, one such tool. Um, but yeah, you really need a really granular idea of what's hap happening in production. Um, especially if your page is highly parallel, you need to understand your critical path really well. So uh, we, we've uh, used tools like Dynatrace, which has similar capabilities with New Relic. It's able to find hotspots in the execution code base, track traffic between the servers, tell you exactly what code path is being used. Uh, we've used tools like uh, Prefix, which runs on the developer's machine. Uh, profiling the website. However, with all of those, they, they boxed us into one way of thinking, and the most real-world success we've had is with a tool from Elasticsearch, the Elastic Stack, which is a composite of tools. We basically throw all the data we have, performance metrics, logs, um, any, any type of uh, data we can get from our system into a giant NoSQL database, and then analyze it do machine learning on various metrics as they come along, and we're able to go back in time through all our data and readjust and relook at new things uh, to constantly adapt. And that's really what we've had the most success with. When you say readjust and relook at new things, can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? Um, so we we've had the, the the site just slow down for a while, and uh, we looked at the basic metrics, uh, just page by page, see if there's one API taking up the most. Uh, most time, and we found that no, it's not really one API. It's the disk, disk usage, uh, CPU, uh, waiting on threads, garbage collection, nothing was indicative until we found that anytime we sent out a large number of emails, we were seeing some spikes, but again, not correlating. And um, it turned out to be a very interesting, uh, by correlating that with database performance stats, uh, by just pulling the database for all the metrics it had every about five seconds, we are able to see that during uh, peak number of calls of a specific type of query, um, it was overloading the IO in the database, causing other processes to wait on that data. Um, yeah, that's a pretty interesting case. And uh, that, that's an example of a tool I really like too. One that, you know, there's another one I'm familiar with that basically samples, uh, it samples like machine instructions to see what's taking the longest or something like that. I wish I could remember the name. Anyway, it's a great example. Okay, let's have a couple more questions to the part session where you can ask more of them, but in person. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, what do you think of including performance testing part of this test suite testing and Having the performance team just like control the threshold kind of decrease in that or more like yeah, budgeting. Think, uh, is, is it, do you have any experience with that? And was it successful or get some pushback, especially yeah, on a product I, where you iterate a lot, right? Yeah, I do, I do have some experience with that. Um, so yeah, this, when I talked about tooling, I was speaking in somewhat vague terms, but you know, I talked about adding tooling, uh, you know, to the test suite, that's exactly the type of thing I had in mind. Um, but I also talked about throwing away infeasible ideas. 
And that's really kind of subjective, right? Like depending on the tolerance of your org for risk, you may be willing to build something really ambitious. When I was working on this, we weren't that ambitious about building. So we would land things that you could accomplish with a static analyzer, like, um, you know, calculating the number of, of additional or removed JavaScript bytes. This is like one really simple example. And um, we, would, we would print that. We would basically blame to a line. Um, so for example, you know, you add a JavaScript dependency in a JavaScript file, and it would literally comment on the diff uh, or fuse fabricator diff or GitHub on the pull request on that line using a bot. Uh, so we did a couple things like that, and that was actually quite effective. Even though we had a profiler that you could use sort of earlier in the developer workflow, it was still important as a savvy check uh, to just have a machine run the check, you know, at, at a stage in the developer workflow that every commit goes through. So I think that's usually important. And really the, the ideal there, at least in my mind, is, you know, a synthetic performance lab where you can, you can ship that change and you can simulate production and literally tell someone, you know, within some margin of error how it's going to behave. That's really hard to do. Uh, I was speaking to someone at Microsoft who almost kind of sort of pulled it off. And he was experiencing things like, uh, you know, disk IO contention. And he had to control for that. Like if he was running multiple experiments on the same machine, that would throw off the perf results by several percentage points. So um, I think that's, that's like what I would love to build. But yeah, anyway, to answer your question, I think it's really important. Thank you. Last question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have this other question uh, where basically it's like predictive uh, modeling is something that basically you just quite skimmed over, but I'd like, I'm curious to know what the state of the art is there and what we'll expect to see in five years or something. Yeah, that's a great question and someone else might want to chime in. Um, I mean, you know, I've, I've worked at companies that built so much, I couldn't tell you the state of the art, but I described a tool earlier where you know, it was a profile that took a, a sample of production data and you could see exactly what was going on. Um, so what if you use that same production data and you just added, you added, you, you know, you ask, what if we add this new piece of infrastructure? And then you go back and use your production, your previous production data to simulate the perfect impact of adding that piece of infrastructure. So for one really simple example, what if we had like, two news feeds on facebook.com. I know that's silly, but anyway, you have two news feeds. So it would go back, add one news feed before the other one, and then just look at how the perf numbers change by recalculating the critical path. Uh, that's the type of predictive model I would love to build, but maybe, maybe there's another better one that you guys know of. Um, one uh, direction we've seen uh, the industry go in is uh, funneling, uh, for example, uh, Microsoft Azure, they have the ability to funnel a portion of traffic to uh, a different version of the application in real time and compare your metrics from that new version of the, the code that you've deployed without affecting the entire code uh, client base. And uh, you could do it based on a subset, well, based on anything you might want to segment. Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. That's a really good example. I've, I've seen that as well. That, that makes a huge difference.